Welcome everyone. You have found Sanctuary's Coffee and Conversation. I'm Myrna Haskell, Executive Editor of Sanctuary Magazine. This is an online publication for women that empowers and inspires with a focus on the arts, humanitarian pursuits, health and wellness, inspirational travel, career, and finance. You can find us at sanctuary-magazine.com. This morning, my guest is Dr. Grace Maloney. She is owner and director of Therathrive. She also has numerous specialties, including um, gifted development, twice exceptionality, and high functioning autism. So I'm so happy to have you here. Good morning, Dr. Grace. Good morning, Myrna. I am so happy to see you and thanks for having me. Oh, sure. Now, just to um, let our listeners know, if, in case they don't, it's National Autism Awareness Month. So mm -hmm. Sanctuary is celebrating with our fourth special issue, Celebrating Autism Awareness. And this particular year, we decided to focus a little bit more on transition to independent life. So a lot of the interviews and articles touch upon that subject. But this morning with Dr. Grace, I would like to talk about um, anxiety and how that sort of bleeds into to this nervousness that many on the spectrum have about adjusting to change, particularly big change. Sometimes they'll even maybe have a meltdown. I think, you know, a lot of neurotypicals have a hard time with change too, right? But for somebody on the Absolutely. spectrum, it's exacerbated. Yeah. So I had um, read, and I think I told you this, Dr. Grace, that approximately 40% of those on the spectrum suffer from some sort of anxiety disorder. But the more I read into it, I know the studies are kind of a little bit all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, but what I did notice that I found is that it is a higher percentage of those on the spectrum that have anxiety versus the neurotypical community, right? So I, my That's first right. question for you is, how does that fit in and how much does that affect someone on the spectrum easily sort of making a major change? I mean, is, does it really affect them when they have the anxiety too? Or I guess we'll just let you run with that one. Well, I think that this is this is a really important topic because adjustment to change can be difficult for anyone. Um, and if if someone um, is with autism, then there is more sensory um, sensory integration or sensory differences that they might take in things differently. And so when there is a change that comes up, it brings up um, everything as if it is bigger. So um, what I guess I want to say is that if you think about um, how our system works, like how our anxiety works, it essentially is useful. It keeps us alive. It helps us to um, it helps us to be to be safe if we are running from something that is dangerous, if we need to act quickly to move out of the way of something, if right. we're preparing for um, an exam even. There are times when anxiety can be really useful and helpful. And people with autism tend to um, be very sensitive to what's around them and they take things in. So it's kind of like the volume um, is up like it's, it's like, it's very sensitive. So just a little change can make it bigger. Yes. And so when you, when you take in, so the thing that I think that's important is, is to look at with adjustment and change is that small changes can seem much bigger. So that's, um, I think then you add in that anxiety and it just makes them seem dangerous. And yeah. that's why it's like, you got to hang on. And that's why someone might have a meltdown because it is life threatening in some way to them. Even if it's to other people, it might seem like a small adjustment. Does, yeah, does that and I think that's why it's, I heard you say that word sensory. And so I was hoping we could talk a little bit about sensory sensitivity and anxiety oh, yeah. and how they play off each other with somebody that who's on the spectrum. I know, I know that, um, and if you want to get into this a little bit, um, whether it's sound sensitivity or light sensitivity, um, you can have office situations, for instance, right, where it's it's a wide open space, yeah. lots of fluorescent lighting um, and noise. And if that's mm -hmm. something that 
a, an autistic is particularly sensitive to, that might be like a really bad like trigger for them in terms of the environment. So I'm hoping, mm -hmm. I know a lot of folks who may be listening may not know exactly what sensory sensitivity is. So if you can start out maybe by explaining what it is and then what happens when they also have that anxiety that's going along with it. Sure. Okay. So sensory sensitivity, it, it essentially means that someone is taking more input. So when we, our senses take in information. So when we see we're taking in light and we're, um, we're, we're processing that and, and into what we see or images, when we hear, we process that and we make sense of it for, and, and, and identify those sounds, whether it's words or music or just um, the ambient wind in the air. Um, and, it's, and that's true for all of our senses, even our senses of, of how we are in space, our proprioceptors, um, our, the feelings of touch. So when someone is highly sensitive or when they have sensory um, adjustment or sensory differences or sensory disorders, they, they take in the senses, the, the information, and either it is too big or too small. So sometimes to feel something, someone might need a lot of pressure, for example, oh, okay. um, or if they're touched super lightly, it can hurt. And so for people who don't have sensory sensitivities, one way to think of it is if, um, you know, let's say the little rib on the sock end, how it kind of rubs on the toe and most people, they just ignore it or they don't notice it. But if, if you have a sense uh, like that, that um, tactile sensitivity, it could feel like really rough vel Velcro rubbing on your foot all day. And so if you kind of think of it that way, you can, you can maybe relate a little more. Yeah. Does, does that make sense? It makes total sense. And, you know, I just had something kind of jump into my mind because I was thinking about school settings. But for somebody that has a super sensitivity to noise, for instance, yeah, think about like those school assemblies that have 100, 200 kids. Right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yes. or even like those college classes, right? Those center college classes mm -hmm. that you do freshman year typically that have like tons of students. So there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of background noise. People, you know, scratching yes. with their pencils, leafing through their work. Um, yes, so that could exactly. be, I can picture that really throwing someone on yes. the spectrum. So I guess it's really important then too, when you look at the transition that you have to look at the physical environment, right? Absolutely. And you're looking at all the things that someone has to adjust to and take care, like in order to take care of themselves, in order just to function, all the things that someone has to think about. For example, if they are in that classroom and there's the scratching and the no of the of the papers and the pencils and all that stuff, plus, you know, people whispering and whatnot, there is also um, a fan going. There's also traffic outside a window if it's a, if, if there's a window there. Um, there's lots to take in. And so what um, a person in, like a student in that situation who is, who is with autism, they would need to be thinking of all these things ahead of time. They might be focused on, I need that seat. Why do you need that seat? I need that seat. And that seat is so important because it's the only seat that the fan's not blowing on. Yeah, and is it now next they're the hyper-focused who... on the fan, right? Right, right. Or is it next to that person that's making noise? Exactly, yeah. exactly. So that's, that's kind of... Um, that's kind of the experience that someone has. They have to think about so much and take to take care of um, just just functioning, just doing these things. So when you throw in something that's different, let's say then they walk into the classroom or, and there's not, a, that seat's gone. Oh, the, yeah. the chairs are rearranged. Then you have Meltdown. to think, what, yeah. what do you do? I can't have that seat, then I can't function, then I can't listen to the lecture, then I can't, you know, do all this. And so it's over, that's an overload. And so what helps is if someone can say ahead of time, hey, the classroom's going to be rearranged, and then, then, then if I were that person, I could, I could go. Okay, I need to get there five minutes early so that I can um, figure out what seat I can sit in. You so know. now, Grace, with with high functioning autism, um, I think I read too when I was looking at some of these statistics that in adulthood, 
the percentage of people with autism that are still experiencing high anxiety goes down a bit. And so my, so I'm wondering if what you feel about that, because I was kind of thinking maybe the reason is if they, is that they've over time when they were a child, they didn't know how to adapt, but over time now they're learning how to adapt what they need. What happens if the chair isn't there? I'm going to do step one, two, three, so yeah. that they have sort of a backup plan. And I'm wondering if that's why it falls off a bit. Um, in terms of, you know, the anxiety real being, really being a super number one issue with change. Yeah, I think you, you, you mentioned that, you know, how, how there's that coping, how that coping, you know, you know what to do, you one, two, and three, you've, you've got that. And, and you have that life experience of what didn't work, and you know that you don't want to do that anymore. So, so yes, there is, there is that sense of, of understanding yourself better. I think also sometimes people, they accept themselves. They don't, one thing that with people with autism really can experience when they're, especially when they're younger and don't understand or don't know what's, you know, no one's, if no one's explained to them and they're really little, um, is they feel different. And they're like, why is everyone else like this? And I'm not, something's wrong with me. And so there's this sense of, that or there can be the opposite. Well, I wonder if something's wrong with everybody else. Right. And where am I? I'm in an alien world. So, but but there's this sense of of acceptance and and ability to, I think, just understand yourself a little better as you get older. But the anxiety may still be present. And um, it's just having those better coping skills. You know, I think also sometimes there's coping skills that they people try when when they're younger and they're really um they don't work or they work for the to cope with the overload or what's going on but they might not work for um you know like let's say like for example head banging that might help with with one situation but it's not a good thing to do overall so so maybe they've learned a different um, replacement for that that is right. just um, just works better and you know in a way too I I heard you mention you know that maybe everybody else isn't functioning correctly and whatever their perspective is but you know I've talked to a lot of last year our focus was actually women on the spectrum young yes. young girls and women on the spectrum and many women on the spectrum are diagnosed very late in life even after the school yes. years and they didn't have the I heard you mention you know what's wrong with me why am I different and they perhaps didn't have those skills to understand what was going on and to help themselves because they didn't know what the situation was. They didn't have a diagnosis. They didn't know what to research and learn about to help themselves. Do you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. Um, what, what I think that, you know, autism is missed in girls much more than in boys. I think that developmentally, there may be some differences and that um, impact how like a teacher or a doctor might see that child. And so, and I don't want to, I don't want to say that it's always, you know, boys and girls are, you know, have those differences because there are many, many exceptions. That's um, like a spectrum, right? It's a huge yeah, spectrum. Yeah. But, yeah. And, and there's also ex all these exceptions to, to, with gender, but, um, it is true that women, especially nowadays with adult women, um, I think that have been missed, but I think that I'm hoping that now that there's more awareness of autism, that um, more, you know, every, you know, fewer people would be missed and um, regardless of their gender. But I think that it used to be, a, you know, years ago that um, mostly only boys were tested. Right. And I, and I think That's there was exactly some- right you know, yeah. acting out behaviors, maybe um, just developmentally, little boys sometimes develop um, physically first, like more of their gross motor skills, and whereas girls might develop their fine motor skills, right. you know, ahead of time. So I think some of those differences um, just got the boys that, that notice. Yeah, uh, but yeah, nowadays, because I think, I think it's so important for them to, to accept 
that their brain is neurodiverse, right? And mm -hmm. here's how I'm going to help myself. And I can be a successful, I can be a PhD, I can be an anesthesiologist, I can be an author, I can be, you know, I, I can do things that I want to do. I just need to make some accommodations so that I'm yeah. more comfortable in this yeah. world around me that wasn't initially comfortable for me, right? Yes. <clears throat> I think that there are many wonderful strengths that come with autism. And so it's about getting to know those strengths just because they're not necessarily um, touted out in the world. It's not something that our culture as a whole um, really emphasizes those particular strengths. So maybe someone doesn't realize their strengths um, just from that neurodiversity. So I think now, a lot of people on the spectrum are actually twice exceptional too, though, right? Yes. They might be really absolutely. gifted in a certain area. Yes. Yes. And I know or you've worked with people. all around. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You've worked with people who are twice exceptional a lot, I think, right? Oh, definitely. That's, that's, um, that's and so if they can, so it, they can celebrate the parts of themselves that they know they have better than most of the rest of the population too, right? That's probably helpful to a certain extent that they have something in them that a lot of other people can't do or don't have. It probably helps with self-esteem issues and things like that, do you think? I think it can if they know about it. But okay. I'm going to tell you, Myrna, oftentimes what comes with that is, is, is lots of challenges. There can be excessive guilt for um, just for being having some ability and then maybe not being able to utilize it in a way that that aligns with their values. Okay. There could be um, that anxiety that they're not they're like that goes with kind of perfectionism. Mm -hmm. So I think that if a, if a child or an adult has identified themselves, has been identified or has identified themselves as gifted and they understand where these things are coming from, I think then they can use that as, as a way to, to, um, to understand and accept and work with themselves and use their strengths to help with yes, their challenges. Right. But I gotta say, if they haven't been identified or they don't know about this, oftentimes it poses more challenge. Okay. Okay. You know, because because it might that. be, I let's understand. say someone has, you know, has, is with dyslexia and they can't read, but they're very bright and maybe they also um, are with autism. So there might be a lot of sense of like something's wrong with me and they might not believe how smart they really are, how capable they could be. Right. So I think that. Well, what about the idea of, so we know that change is difficult. And as I said earlier, change is difficult for a lot of people, but super, super difficult for those on yeah. the spectrum. And so I'm wondering what you feel about in terms of preparing I, either as a parent or a caregiver or a friend, someone for the change, whatever it is, it's a move to a new neighborhood. It's, it's a change going from say middle school to high school or high school to college. Do you advocate taking baby steps versus like just having them dive in or does it really depend on what the situation is? What works? I think it depends on the situation and the person though. I think baby steps is always a good idea if you're not confident in what to do. Okay. So if there is a change, for example, um, let's say you're going off to college. Mm -hmm. And so baby steps would involve, um, you know, and that whole thought is overwhelming. So baby steps would be even more than maybe typical. Maybe typical um, kids, when they're going off to school or young adults, they're, um, they're going to pick the best program for what they want to study, or there's some reason why they'll pick a, a school or a university. And then um, they'll maybe they'll visit the campus, they'll apply, et cetera. And, and that visit, then they'll do the orientation and they'll get a picture of what things look like and, and, um, and kind of have to prepare themselves and work through that. However, someone um, with autism would probably benefit from breaking each of those steps down into more steps. Okay. So visiting the school might not just be doing the campus tour. It might be actually looking at um, some walking through some dorm 
um, hallways to see the types of activity that is in the different dorm rooms um, when it's not a show, because like sometimes they show the dorm room and it's like an empty one because you don't want to invade someone's personal room when they do the right, tour. Right. So it's, it just kind of gives you the layout, which is helpful too. Um, I'm not saying don't do that. Or those like things. walking through the cafeteria probably. Oh, too, right? I think, I think actually ordering something from the cafeteria, tasting the food, seeing how like experiencing yes. while you have your support network with you. So while you're with a friend or a parent um, to, 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 you know, you know, you can usually order food at the school cafeteria, um, even without a card, if you right. pay for it. So to get something there. So actually immersing themselves in the environment. And each is very of those helpful, might, you're saying then. yes, and each of those might take a day because each one might be intense. And so then you need to rest after. And that's the other thing that's so important oh, is yeah. pacing and resting. Mm -hmm. So words this it takes those baby steps take more time because right. you're you're having to instead of going to let's say the campus for a day you might be going for three days and you I know. guess it depends on the person but absolutely a, a baby step might be a step on its own but say going to junior college first where you're not oh dealing yeah with dorm life on top of new people you don't know and, and a new learning environment and now you're sleeping away from home too, for instance. I Absolutely, guess, I, I think. And, um, and a lot of the people I work with, they will go to um, college and get an AA degree um, while they're in high school or before, you know, while they're still pretty young. Okay. So that that is often the case. Okay. You know, and to get okay. used so to it's, yeah. So do you have, so I think I'm hearing too, like with the small steps, so it depends on the person, obviously. And as we said before, yeah. it's a very large spectrum and the situation. But I think what I'm hearing a little bit in here is that with these steps and this insecurity about big change, a bit of it is a fear of the unknown, right? Yeah. And that can be with, I, I would think that could be with like all kinds of things. I mean, even just with summertime activities, going to a new pool, you know, right. A club, oh, right? Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of stuff going on there, right? And noise mm -hmm. and it's a different environment. There's just so much to it. I think I heard you say it's exhausting to yes, have to deal is. with what's going on in their brain, bring things down and then get used to what is the unknown. So I guess what I what I'm hoping you might be able to share with our listeners is do you have any like specific pieces of advice for maybe a specific situation or situations in general for how someone on this spectrum could prepare themselves better so there's not as much of this fear of the unknown? Well, I think this kind of goes back to what we were talking about with those small steps. So if you're going to the pool, one thing might you know, B is you can see if there's any research online about the pool first and, but just kind of get that knowledge because one thing that I've noticed is that having information can help alleviate some anxiety because then you're not guessing. The anxiety is telling you that something is dangerous. So, or something might be dangerous. So it's like caution, caution. And so you want to, if you check something out, then your imagination can't go wild with all the possible um, things to be worried about. And you can see, okay, this is, there's steps there. There's a railing, there's, this is where people hang out. You know, you can kind of know ahead of time. Um, the other thing is, is to prepare yourself to plan ahead so that you can take breaks from that stimulus. So if you need to have like a little like tent at the pool, like, you know, people go in there to get some shade, um, you know, or whatever, or, or make sure to take bathroom breaks. Even if you don't have to use the, the restroom, it's helpful to maybe get up, walk somewhere where you can have a moment of quiet and okay. then walk back. And so, um, you know, people might schedule that actually so that they make sure to do that. So they'll go, okay, you know, between the hour of two and three, and I try not to say, you know, do it at this time, because then people might be concerned about the particular time, but, you know, around this much time, right, uh, right. you know, approximately, then in this range, go walk around the perimeter 
or um, get a drink of water, but do something to help give a break. Because when you, like you mentioned, it's exhausting, yes. you know, you're holding so much and you're taking so much. I mean, in it and- sounds exhausting just as we're discussing it, right? <laughs> Yeah. You know, to deal with all of that constant, the constant stimuli, the constant thinking about what you're going to say, when you're going to say it, just like all of that is, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. It so I love that idea about taking some quiet time. Um, do you think that showing pictures, say on a, I don't know, this might work better for younger children than for those like trying to seek independent life now, right? Or, or leave home to go into a college situation. But for a younger student, maybe showing pictures on a computer before you even visit the physical oh, environment. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that that helps for younger people, but I actually also think it helps for adults or any okay. age. Yeah, absolutely. That, um, I think can help alleviate anxiety. And like I said, it gives you that picture in your mind. So you kind of know what to expect. You, you know what it's going to look like. Um, and after you look at picture, if you need to like go to the parking lot or whatever, go to the outside of the building and look, kind of check it out, su- get like a recon trip to suss out the, the environment that can also be helpful. And then maybe too, because we did a lot with um, talking about in this particular issue, um, you know, independent life and seeking that first job, you know, becoming employed for those who are able to. Um, It's probably very important that they understand the environment before they even go to the interview, right? Like, is it a is it just a piece of a floor in a really large building? You know, is the building in the country? Is it in the city? You know, what's the situation for lunch? You know, what's besides like the personalities of the people you're going to work with, mm-hmm. right? So um, I would just think that that would also be really important. I mean, do you have any tips on, you know, moving into the workforce or what someone on the sub- yeah. spectrum should really do or look for that would probably maybe be a better environment for them than something else? Yes, absolutely. One of the things that I recommend to my clients a lot is when they're um, setting out a work, you know, situation, when they're being interviewed, they're also interviewing that, that workplace because, um, they need to know that that's where they want to be. And I also kind of like what we were talking about with um, when they go to university, um, kind of getting that environmental feel, you know, looking around, what are the students like? What are they doing? Are they, you know, do people, is this a, you know, is this particular dorm really, stu- you know, quiet is or it, loud? Right. Or is it party it's, central? Or yes, I guess that in office too, you would want it. I know we've all gotten that sense. You walk into certain work environments and it's like the stress is dripping off the walls, right? Exactly. And then another environment, everybody's maybe smiling and being friendly with one another, right? So right. And maybe that talking can... to other people if they know somebody that's worked in the particular yeah, area. Yeah, if they have place, a friend right? or they know somebody from that's worked there, that would be even better. But if they, what they can do, though, is at that interview, so it's a little harder with video interviews um, nowadays, but if, you know, if they were to interview in person, then they can walk down the hall and, you know, after their interview to, you know, maybe to get a drink of water or whatnot, and, um, and, and kind of check out how people are interacting. Like you said, if they're smiling and they they seem to be kind to one another, that's really important because it tells you that not only is the environment maybe more conducive to a healthy psychological um, environment, that the people there are probably, you know, engaged and friendly with each other. And so that can make a big difference because if you are, um, you know, I think people, you know, with autism, are pretty sensitive to bullies and who might not be kind. And so um, if they're going into a new situation, a new work environment, you know, it's important to know that there's going to be, you know, somebody who's going to be an ally, someone who's going to be friendly. Okay. And then also probably practicing the interviews, right? Like if you're, Oh yeah. if, if a question and everybody can do this, right. Yeah. But if a question, if something, if you don't understand something, 
be comfortable saying, you know, I no, I don't really know that, or but I'd love to learn, or like have some mm -hmm. canned responses maybe ahead of time that might help with interview yes. stress. Yeah. And for anybody, you know, I guess. One of the things that we talk about sometimes is is just, you know, how long to look at someone and then to not look at them. And and it, again with video, it's it that's much easier. Yeah. Because you know, but but in person it's sometimes like, well, how long do I look at someone's face? And right. then how long and do I look the, to the side the a missing little bit? Cues, the missing the social cues and maybe the facial expressions a bit, even if they are ready and prepared to work you know, to be in the yeah. workforce. So and all so of that is, it's yeah. okay. It's okay to ask, was that, was that a joke? Cause you know, sometimes, I mean, maybe not like that way, but you would, you would ask because sometimes it's hard to know if someone's being serious or asking you a real question or if, um, if, if, if that was it meant to be, um, just a, like a, a joke or sarcastic and sometimes it's hard to tell and so I think it's it's okay to to kind of get clarification or to ask or just kind of watch and see what they do yeah and, and so it's those things like that that you just prepare for in an interview and the thing that I think is if the person that is interviewing you isn't okay with how you ask or how you ask your questions or how you are responding then that might not be what you want I think is to really look at where your values are. I mean, maybe you want to do that. Maybe you think, okay, I can do this for a, a couple of years or a temporary um, position. How but do I you think feel maybe inside when you leave the interview, right? Yeah, I like that. Or you that. leave the college campus. Yeah. Like, are, are you comfortable? Are you relaxed? Or are you like wound up like a top? You couldn't wait to get out of there, right? Yes. That's going to be a sign that That's things aren't internal quite right data. Here. And it's yeah. <laughs> so valuable, but it's important to also look at that internal data in relation to anxiety. Okay, how much of this was my anxiety telling me I'm in a new situation that could be scary? Okay. And how much of this is is really, you know, telling me that this isn't this isn't the place I want to be or I love it here. Yeah. You know. <laughs> It could be well, that. Thank too. you. I mean, this is this has been great. I, I really appreciate you sharing the advice with our readers. Um, and I want to give you the opportunity because I know people who are listening want to learn more about Thera Thrive. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about your practice and how people can reach you if they'd like to get in touch. Well, thank you. I would love to. So um, my practice is Thera Thrive, like you mentioned, and um, I think the website's going to be on on this. What's yes, we'll, we'll definitely post the website. So okay. hang out listeners till you see um, <laughs> our credits page because it will be there. So you don't have to write it down right now, but okay. Yeah. Um, and so what we, we specialize in neurodiversity. So we work with people who are gifted, who are highly sensitive, who are on the autism spectrum, who um, might have ADHD or even a, a brain injury or mm -hmm. other differences, sensory differences, learning differences. And, um, and we do assessment, we, we provide therapy, we provide consultation, and we also have groups. And I wanted to say that one of the things that's been really fun um, is that we have these role play game groups, they're social groups, and um, we have them for children, we have them for teens, and we have them for adults. Um, we also have some other groups. Um, we have an astrology group where oh, you just great. learn about yourself through other means and, and um, super fun ways to connect with other people who are neurodiverse as well. So do you, um, do you provide in-person and virtual services? Yes, yes, okay. we are. We're all pretty much all virtual right now. Some of our assessment, we um, have to do in office, but just small portions. We do what we can virtually. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for your expertise. I'd like to end as I always do by wishing all of our listeners and our readers good health, happiness, and continued inspiration. Thanks for joining us.